Blog Talk Radio. Good evening and welcome live from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, where it's cold. <laughs> it's just cold, and I'll tell you that. We've got a great show. This is Scary Cast. I'm Dr. John Stamey. We're going to have a lot of fun tonight. We've got a, a heck of a great crew that has called in. Dr. Trey Donaway has a hall pass. He is still trying to, um, how can we put it? He's still trying to pack up and move out of his house. So we'll, we'll certainly give him a hall pass on that one. First of all tonight, number one in everybody's book, the queen of scary cast, none other than Robin McCray. How are you doing tonight, Robin? You there? Does it sound like Robin she's there? Man? Oh, well, maybe she will be. Maybe something happened. Anyway, we've got from Los Angeles, or actually Hollywood, California, West Hollywood, we have the one and only Devin Tate. How are you doing tonight, Devin? I'm doing great. Enjoying a beautiful sunset here in in West Hollywood, California. Buddy, we are so jealous of you. It is just freezing in Myrtle Beach, but that's okay. We're just glad to have you here. and um, Glad to be here. And and from way up north, you have broken all barriers, Mark Johnson, from Niagara Falls, Canada. How are you doing? Good. I don't want to hear you complain about a cold night, so you come up here and, and uh, hang out with me on a true Canadian winter night. <laughs> no, I'm sure it's a lot colder up here than it is down in uh, sunny Myrtle Beach. So. I ain't going to do that. That is too cold for me. <laughs> and right now, I think it's about 40. Is I think. Let me see what it says. It says it's 41 degrees, and I am shivering. It's just, I didn't, how how, how can I put it? I didn't sign up for this, but I guess I did. It's still not bad, and we're just just glad. And is the Queen of Scary Cast with us, Robin McRae? Yeah, I could hear you guys fine, but you couldn't hear me. We can hear you now, and we are so glad you're here. Yeah, I'm glad to be back. We've got tonight one of the greatest guests of all time on ScaryCast. He's so good, we want him here every month. He is the one and only from Roswell, New Mexico, John LeMay. John, how are you doing tonight? I'm always great when I'm on ScaryCast, so I'm ready to get going. I like that. I like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are so glad you're here with us. You've always got great things in entertainment and you're an author, you're a researcher, you just do all kinds of stuff that I'm so jealous of. I, I need to quit my day job and, and I need to start doing what you do because I know it's fun. But anyway, thank you very much for being here with us. And um, we, we are going to begin. We are all set, locked, loaded, and ready to go. Yeah, John. Just or, um, yeah. What? What did you say, Robin? I was going to tell him I need to send him the UFO pictures from here. Well, I would love those. Yeah, we oh, had yeah. Um, we had an episode about a month ago, and it was incredible. Well, we get them here probably out of seven days. We get UFOs probably four to five days a week. I mean, that's that's normal. We've had them where they flash back and forth like they're trying to, you know, communicate. And then another one would come in and they'd flash back and forth to each other. Um, last week we had two times we had one that went tree line right across from our house. And I've seen them multiple times. I had one that was just like right over my car and I could see the whole underside of it. But about a month ago, my son-in-law had walked out on the porch and he hollered for me to come out. And there was this enormous UFO. It was a little bit in the distance. It wasn't right on the house like most of them are. It was farther away. And you could see it spin like a top, and you could see the rectangles in the window, window, and they were all different colors. And then right next to it was like a sphere shape that was red dot. So he got video footage of it, and then we took and made stills from the video footage, cause, and he did get a couple of pictures as well. 
And he actually, unbeknownst to me, he sent it to MUFON. And MUFON, like, just lost their minds over it. So they said they were going to do a, a complete investigation. And then, like, four or five days later, they contacted him and said that, as far as they were concerned, it was not terrestrial, that it was a Class 1 sighting, as far as they were concerned. And, Robin, what this is Dr. John. What I will do, you sent me everything in one email, didn't you? Oh, okay, yeah, just forward it. I think I did. Forward it to John. Um, I enlarged some of them. Yeah, I enlarged some of them. I don't think I sent those to you, but he can enlarge them as well. Yeah, I, I, will, I will send one to all of the co-hosts. And and Trey, yeah. even though you know, so we'll we'll send one to everybody. Cool. And they yeah. were great. There, we there just, was one, there was one picture that is absolutely spectacular. I believe. Yeah. In my in my in my fairly long experience of twenty five years investigating UFOs, that is the best picture of a UFO I have ever seen. So John Lemay, yeah, you'll Mufon be getting those tonight at first thing in the morning. Okay. <laughs> Awesome. The other thing well, Robin, that's really weird, yeah. and John, maybe you can tell me, Lemay. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know which how to say which John. Um, yeah. Maybe you can give some insight on this. I've I was had just, UFOs. Oh, sorry. I, I thought you just meant in general. Yeah. <clears throat> no, you. Um, I've had UFOs around me my whole life. My first abduction, I was four. Um, I've had them come down in the yard while I was outside, and then I've had missing time, all kinds of stuff. So anyway, we moved here to South Carolina. It, obviously, it didn't let up. Um, we've had some ET encounters, that type of thing. But not only my husband and I have we seen them, but people that have been here have seen them. And I had a friend that actually woke up during the middle of the night and realized his phone was dead and he left his charger in the car. So he walked out to the car, got it, and turned around, and there was a UFO above my garage. But um, my son-in-law went on Google Earth. And he was looking at the house from Google Earth. And the first time he looked at it, he saw nothing amiss, you know, on the roof or anything. He just looked at it. And about a month later, he did it again. And we had had a large amount of UFOs at that time. And it looked like an emblem on our roof directly above my bedroom. And it didn't, I mean, it was bizarre. It was some weird shapes. In figures. I mean, it wasn't like it said anything. It was triangles and some other things, but it looked like an emblem that was on the roof directly above my bedroom. And he came and got me and he said, look at this. He said, it's like you're marked or something because he said, that wasn't there when I looked at it before. I said, well, I've looked at the, the property on Google Earth before and I've never seen it, but it, it was absolutely there. And then when he checked several weeks later, it was gone again. But when it was gone again, we were still getting UFOs, but not the concentration that we were when that thing was on the roof. Hey, Robin, do you have any uh, type of, like, you should get some, like, night vision or thermal or something if you're getting a lot of oh, sightings. I, have those. I think uh, No, I have, have those. those yeah, cool. in fact, my son-in-law was using them one night, and there was a little ET that was standing across the road. And <laughs> I actually walked towards it, and he was, like, freaking out. Don't do it, don't do it. But I didn't get a bad vibe off of them. Like, I've had bad ones come before. And they're not, trust me when I tell you, they're not coming back. But that one was fine. And I got probably 30, 40 feet before it turned and ran into the woods. It was like, it wasn't very big and it was more of a whitish color. It wasn't one of the little grays. It wasn't one of the Zetas. But yeah, you can pick them up on the thermal. The ships you can get on the thermal too. If you like, if you're looking up at the sky and you can't really see them, and then you put them on that thermal, they they show up. But I don't know what the deal is lately. We've had like in the, the last week and then the week prior, it's a, a disc, but it's bright, like a bright light, and it comes and it skims right directly above the tree line in front of my house, and it just it goes at lightning speed. And then guaranteed every time it does within 30 minutes, we've got helicopters over the house and over the woods across the road. Crazy. That's pretty conspiracy theory stuff. That's great. We deal in conspiracy <laughs> theories here. We, we, we talk about them all the time because, Robin, you and me and Mark and Devin and John LeMay know that sometimes conspiracy theories 
are true. Is is that correct? Ninety nine point nine percent of the time. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction, right? Conspiracy fact, right? You know, I always it, 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 said, and not just with the ETs and the UFOs, but with the cryptids and all, especially the cryptids and the paranormal stuff. You know, what's been created that everybody thinks our world is never ever existed. It's all a fantasy. It's an illusion. It's what was created and told to us and preached to us to get us to believe it. What's happening now is all of these things are coming to the front burner and people are finding out that we've been lied to all along. You know, our minds were trained to never see these things because we were told they didn't exist. And they're making themselves loud and proud now so that people don't have a choice but to realize that, you know, not only were we lied to, but the world we had was not true. Yeah, perhaps we're being like acclimatized and conditioned to to this ex, uh, exposure or ET revelations. Uh, it's not just going to be like a one-time kind of thing where we go from first gear to fourth. Maybe it's like a process, right, for public to accept it through cultural yeah. things or whatever else, right? And uh, yeah, well, I right. you know I had and I we had briefly touched and this last time to think because I want to hear what John has to say. But I had gotten contacted nine, ten months ago, and I was given a message from the ETs on what I was supposed to put out there, and it was basically on how they abduct and take possession of people. And they said, you know, people are going to laugh at you. They're not going to believe you, but you have to, you know, no matter what, you got to get this out there so people know. Never have I found a platform to do it yet because, quite honestly, people aren't ready to hear what they said. But what they well, told what, me Robin, coinc- if, if, coincided if, if with what I knew mind, about it. If you wouldn't mind, we've got two shows scheduled. We've got our Valentine's Day show scheduled with Jen Cruz and you. Y'all are our, you two are our Valentines. And then <laughs> we've right, got Scott Dill. <laughs> and then we've got Scott Dill from New Hanover Tavern, ghost hunt, paranormal stuff. He's going to come back. He was just a really wonderful guest. So maybe on February the 28th, which is an auspicious day for me, a very important day, and I need to get through February 28th. But um, we'll, you know, we, we might just have you on to uh, relay all that information. Would that be okay? Yeah, like I said, I think it's going to be a lot for people to take. I'm not quite certain that our people are ready for it yet, but the truth is the truth. You can't change it. We, and we, we everything that, that I was told backed up what I've learned through my lifetime and experiences with them. So that that really freaked me out because it was like yeah. it's one thing to suspect something, but it's another to hear it from the horse's mouth, you know. That's right. The, the horse is a lot more personal than, <laughs> than anything else you'll get. <laughs> so that'll be great, and we'll be glad to have you doing that. And I'll be able to announce – um, on that date, the reissue of Look Up in the Sky, Aliens, UFOs, and Anomalies, I'm adding one story. I'm taking a couple things out, and we're going to have a new book. And then I am pleased to say, John LeMay, before I get you started, can I, can, can I tell people what you're helping me with? Oh, yeah, please do. Well, John LeMay graciously uh, offered to help me format the Lizard Man Companion, the new book, it is finished. Uh, it's, in my opinion, it is the equivalent of a doctoral dissertation. I have written one. I know what a doctoral dissertation is, and I am so proud of it. And, I mean, I couldn't be any happier that the renowned author, John LeMay, is help is helping me get put together. It's, it's truly Sounds like it's going to be fabulous. I can't wait to read it. Well, I believe it will be, and we're going to be doing, now believe it or not, we're going to be doing the initial book signing at Five Points in Columbia at uh, Blue Tile Skateboards, the hoppinest, coolest skateboard shop on the East Coast, and he is down there on Five Points. Dave Blue Tile said he would love to have us come in and set up, and we'll have... uh, I hope Robin will be there. I hope Trey will be there. I hope 
Susan Green, the greatest lady wrestler of all time, she's already committed. She said, I don't care what day it is. I'm going to be there. I said, okay, good. good. Thank you, Susan. So we're going to have, we're going to have all the stars and the superstars. And I will say that we are engineering the Lizard Man Festival for November 17, November 12th. And that is going to be starring, of all people, Lyle Blackburn and John LeMay. We're gonna get John awesome. out, out of Roswell. We're gonna get John out of Roswell. He's gonna he's gonna come experience some real South Carolina hospitality. So John, it'll be wonderful having you here, and uh, we'll have two lizard man books. Well, two and a half, because I'm adding um, actually two stories to look up in the sky. One is an Indian creation story that thunder came from the lizard man. And I can't wait to put that story in the book. It is going to be it, – it didn't need to go in the Lizard Man Companion. That is, a general, that is a general statement of faith of some Indians in California, and I just thought it was best to put it in – and that's the real reason I, I want to reissue um, Volume 2 or Second Edition because it, I think it's very, it's very important, and I – I don't I don't even know how I found it, but I sure did. Anyway, John LeMay, Disappearances, why are we here tonight? Well, I've got a story from Mark's neck of the woods all the way up in Canada. Um, it's pretty rare that you'll find a UFO story from 1930s Canada, and I don't know much about Canada. Maybe Mark can help uh, tell us if he's even heard of this place or knows where it is. And I've only seen it spelled out. I've never heard it pronounced, but it looks like you say it, Anjakuni Lake in Nun, Nunavut, Canada. Yeah. <laughs> I might yeah, have, none of it. So, have you heard that, Mark? Yeah, none of it is uh, – we have a lot of provinces. That's our, what we call states. But then we also have these territories, which are in the Arctic territories, and none of it is part of the kind of Arctic territory. So that's where the Inuit would be, and that's where – it's very cold, obviously even more so cold than where I'm at, way up there, way up north. Mark, is it, yeah, is okay. it colder it up than up on the map, yeah. 41 degrees? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's cool, though. So, so tell us about the story. Okay. You know me, I, I can never remember <clears throat> what I've written. And so this comes from a book, one of Noe and I's UFO history books we're doing on the 1930s, and it hadn't even come out yet, so it'll be brand new. But it's a story about a, a whole village of uh, Inuit peoples who disappeared. And uh, I'm just going to kind of have to read it because I, I can't re- remember any more of the details if I don't look at them. Even though I wrote the chapter, I, just, I can't remember unless I look at it. So um, our story begins in late November of 1930 with a trapper named Joe LaBelle. He was on his way to a small Inuit village he had visited before near Anjakuni Lake. And uh, to his shock, when he got there, he found that this small village, which usually had about uh, 25 people in it, was completely deserted. Um, You know, at first, you know, he saw it from a distance, and uh, he thought, you know, everybody was just inside their tents. Um, But he couldn't really see any fires going or anything like that, which was odd. So he, he crept closer and closer to this village. And uh, he started to look inside the tents, and he couldn't find anybody inside any of the tents. Um, And he did find um, that they had left all of their possessions there, and that included their food and their guns. So, you know, common sense told him that if they had uh, picked up to move away permanently, you know, they wouldn't leave their food, and they sure wouldn't leave their guns. So he, you know, started to suspect that, you know, maybe something bad had happened, but he didn't know what yet. And now I'm going to quote uh, what LaBelle said in, in the article that appeared back in 1930. He said, I felt immediately that something was wrong. In view of half-cooked dishes, I knew they had been disturbed during the preparation of dinner. In every cabin, I found a rifle leaning beside the door, and no Eskimo goes nowhere without his gun. I understood that something terrible had happened. So, you know, again, it seemed like they left in a hurry. Um, But, you know, years later, people started to think, well, maybe they didn't didn't leave. Maybe they were taken. And what kind of indicates that uh, 
maybe they literally just disappeared from the face, face of the earth as LaBelle, you know, naturally, you know, LaBelle, that's the name of the, the uh, prospector I was talking about. He, uh, you know, naturally thought to himself, well, let's go out and look for footprints or tracks, you know, leading away from the village. And he went and he couldn't find any. And I, I mean, I guess up there you could argue that this, maybe the snow had fallen and filled them all in. But um, still, though, when he went out, he found uh, some of the, the tribe's dogs. They were about 300 yards from the village, and they were just out there by themselves, which was another weird thing. Most of them had starved to death. And, um, you know, LaBelle, he didn't know what to think. Um, I'm kind of going through my chapter here, jogging my memory. So LaBelle, he walked all the way to Churchill, and he reported uh, this disturbing find to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police over a telegraph. And um, so he, once he got their attention, they returned with them to the spot, and LaBelle was able to lead them there. So they did uh, find the Mounties did uh, get to observe the deserted village for themselves. And I can't remember where this information comes from, but the Mounties were said to observe pulsating bluish lights on the horizon of the village. So that was kind of one of the, the first indications that maybe, you know, UFOs and aliens could have been involved. But again, the, so this story um for many years, people thought maybe the story was a hoax because most people would see it in books on UFOs, and they didn't see the actual newspaper article from 1930. And because they couldn't see it, they, they just started to say, well, maybe these authors just made up this story, and then one author copied it into his book and so on. But in more recent years, they have found this article, and it was for a fact. Uh, published on November 28, 1930 in the Le Paz, Manitoba newspaper. And if you dig around yourself, you can probably find it on Newspaper Archive or newspaper.com. So it is a real article. You know, I've seen the screenshots of it. Um, so it got a lot of attention. And uh, there seemed to be kind of a cover-up on the part of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police because they – they would try to say that it never happened, and they released a statement. And their official statement from the Royal Can Canadian Mounted Police, I think this was back in the 1980s or something, uh, they said the story about the disappearance in the 1930s of an Inuit village near... Sorry, I dropped my phone for a second. <laughs> okay, uh, an Inuit village near Lake Anjikuni is not true. An American author by the name of Frank Edwards is purported to have started this story in his book, Stranger Than Science. It has become a popular piece of journalism, repeatedly published and referred to in books and magazines. There is no evidence, however, to support such a story. A village with such a large population would not have existed in such a remote area of the Northwest Territories, uh, furthermore, the mounted police who patrolled the area recorded no untoward events of any kind, and neither did local trappers or missionaries. But, uh, you know, again, that statement's wrong because there really was a newspaper article. And of all people who investigated this story was the famous abductee uh, Betty Hill, you know, Barney and Betty Hill. And what happened was in the late 1970s, Betty Hill was on a cruise, and she met uh, a guy from – uh, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. She said his name was Captain Larson. And uh, she, I guess, you know, I mean, because he had met her, you know, he knew her from the, the you know, realm of UFOs. And they were talking about UFOs. And this Captain Larson brought up to Betty Hill the story of the uh, Andrew Cooney Lake disappearance. And this guy said, in his opinion, uh, that the dis disappearance was the result of a mass alien abduction. So you have it from one of the Mounties themselves to Betty Hill, which is pretty incredible. But that's well, that, oh, that really just the story, though. I mean, th th that's amazing. And, and I'll say this, um, and, and, and this will probably be the most controversial statement I have ever made. The book of John in the New Testament was written 100 years after the death of Christ, and that is one of the most revered and respected writings on the life of Christ. And you can't tell me that the Royal Canadian Mounted Police 
know anything from 50 years ago. Now, John, do you have a copy of their retraction or their statement? No, I mean, just the one that I, I had read uh, just a few minutes ago, and that's it. Well, I mean, that is stunning, and that is that borders on stupid. Sorry. Because you got to Well, if I can interject on. here for a second, guys. Yes, sir. I can sir. interject here for a second. And I don't want to be like uh, too much of a skeptic here, but just the one thing that comes to mind as a possibility, and I've had friends who are from Inuit descent, is there's a lot of uh, bad blood between tribes up there. The only thing of a, a full on tribe just disappearing is a potential conflict with other neighboring tribes, such as the Cree down south. They've, they've kind of they had their own wars over the year. Although 1930s, I would think that would be a, a bit too late for that to happen. But I'm just going to throw that out there as a possibility when you think about tribal disappearances <clears throat> happening. But I don't I really, in this case, to be honest, I don't think so. I just wanted to throw that out there. All right. Now, my next question goes to Robin McRae. Robin, you with us? Yes, yeah, I'm here. Do you get if I may ask you to, what do you get about this event? Oh, they were totally taken. 100%. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying it. There's, and I can't, right off the top of my head, I, I can't even begin to tell you where it was at. I think it was in California, but I'm probably wrong. There was um, another episode where, and it wasn't Native Americans, but it was a group of people they lived way up in the rocks on the side of a mountain their whole entire village was up there everything they did was up there they very seldom did they leave it and they literally disappeared and there was that had happened i don't know hundreds of years ago but there was a gentleman and his wife that had stopped there because it was almost like a tourist attraction where you could walk up there to the different levels. And a gentleman walked up there, told his wife he'd be back in like 10 minutes. He was going to go to the lower level. He went in there and decided to go to the upper level, which happened to be where this tribe of people lived and disappeared. And there was over, they figure over well over a thousand of them and they just disappeared and vanished. There's no trace of them, no remains, no nothing. And so he decided he would go to that second level. And they actually have a picture of somebody that encountered him and a girl was taking a photo and he was not, it wasn't of, intentionally of him, but he was actually in the photo because he was standing there. So they have proof he made it to the second level. To this day, they've never seen or heard from him again. And they believe, and I firmly believe it as well that there was some type of a portal that was there and they literally went into this portal and I tried to connect with this man and when I did he was there with these little tiny ETs I mean they weren't the Zetas they were but they were little and he was there and, and they were like all around it was really weird but I, you know, it was very bizarre to me because they went and they did some testing in the area and they found what they believed to be a portal there up in those rocks. You know, I mean, okay, I think now, that's happened now, now, a lot more than we realize. What is the location as best you can determine of, 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 this, of this place? I'm trying to remember. I saw it a couple of years ago on TV. Yeah, it was on, okay. I believe, David. Was it on David Pilates? No, no it wasn't David. Yeah, they, yeah, it was called yeah, Vanished. It was called Vanished. Yeah, it wasn't on David's. It was a, no, it wasn't on David's. I was just asking Pat if he remembered. Yeah, they had, um, David Pilates was in it, but he was, had gone up in the mountains with, somebody in Mount Shasta, but that had something different. The guy that disappeared, they used to call him the, the walking man because he walked everywhere. It was just really oh. incredible, and it really resonated with me because if you go back and you look through the course of time, there is multiple 
places where entire groups of people have simply vanished. There's never found any remains. They have left, you know, any firearms or anything that would have protected them or whatever, and they're all gone at the same time. Realistically, entire groups of people do not vanish together. They don't wake up in the morning and say, hey, you know what, let's get all of us together. We're just going to pop out of here. It doesn't work that way. And they never found any path of travel had they decided they were going to leave. And so I, I've always found that very, you know, telling. I mean, if there's no path of travel, there's no where, where people can determine that they've left. If you can't go out on the ground, there's only one place left to go, and that's up. You know, and then we've seen and heard so many different stories of people with abductions. You know, I mean, look at Travis Walton. You know, I mean, these things actually happen, and I think it's really hard for people to believe it because it's one of those things where unless it happens to them, they don't want to believe it because we've been programmed to believe those things don't happen. But the reality is, is that they do. And it happens to hundreds of thousands of people a year. Not all of them are reported. So I don't believe in my heart of hearts that it's that far fetched to think that an entire tribe could be taken like that, because I think that's happened probably more than we ever realized. So if I can interject here, uh, you know, being in Canada, obviously Inuit are a big part of our peoples, and there's a lot of history involvement in Canada. And I always knew about their connection with the stars and things like that, and, they, and their own folklore. They're kind of being isolated. They kind of had their own uh, legends and everything. And I, and I was just curious about it while you guys were talking, and I uh, looked in Inuit folklore, and apparently there's all these supernatural beings that they talk about called Mahana, which are a demon that terrorizes the Arctic and uh, apparently tickles its victims to death. And there's like these shapeshifters that change into Arctic animals and disguise themselves. So I'm just reading upon that now because I know that they have their own very unique kind of folklore being way up there. And they're very tied into stars such as star maps and that type of thing as well. And uh, being like the Northern Lights up there too, which is kind of, you can think of a supernatural phenomenon. So I'm just throwing that out there, uh, maybe to check out some of the folklore that's involved with that because just like you know john like down in the states there that there's uh folklore involved in the states in some of these areas that might might hold some validity but oh my god you know, I'm sitting here, oh. and, and, and you know I'm, I'm sitting here in the middle of the boot hags and the haints and the witches i am right next to Polly's island and that is where it all happens and i'm telling well, you man you, you talk of, oh my god you talk about uh, folklore, we've got it right here where I live. I think that's why I live here. Okay. Yes, Robin? Well, I mean, not only does this happen to our people, but it also happens to the cryptids. I mean, and they're very vocal about it. They, There are factions of ETs or star people or whatever you want to call them that they are very fearful of. They have some that they get all excited about and they're they're perfectly fine with, but there are some that actually hunt them and take multiple of their people. I mean, it, it happens. Like I never realized that that was an issue or a problem. And we had, when I lived in Michigan, we had a UFO that came down in the back of our field and they were terrified. They were absolutely petrified. <coughs> Excuse me. And I asked them why they were so terrified. And they said, because they're coming for us. And it's like this, you know, it's not just our people they're taking. They're taking the cryptids. They're taking all kinds of stuff. And then you have to to look and see all the genetic mutations they've created. I mean, this is a a real thing. I mean, it happens. There are so many people with disappearance. I went to Pennsylvania um, to do some work with cryptids there and, while I was there, there was a sign on the side of the road. And, you know, if you go various places, you know, you'll see the crosses or flowers or whatever on the side of the road that people will put up for their loved ones that might have been in an accident of some kind. Only this one looked very odd to me. And it, I can't remember exactly what it said on it, but it didn't make any sense. And the person I was with, I said to her, I said, you know, 
what is that? And she said, because there was a UFO that literally pulled somebody out of their car up in the air and just basically shredded them. And everybody saw it. You know, it, it wasn't hidden. It was in broad daylight. You know, this stuff is real. It happens. If you're taken and you make it back, God bless you. Because a lot of hey people guys. don't. So I'm just reading uh, further on this topic of uh, uh, Inuit folklore. And apparently there's something called the Taktarikasit, which are shadow people who are rarely seen but often heard. The Kalupaluk, scaly human-like creatures that snatch children into the sea. Inupasukluk, giants who capture humans. And Tunuit, who are seen as simple-minded but extremely strong ancestors to Inuit. So even just in this thing that I'm reading here, it seems like there is in their folklore, some supernatural beings that are involved with kidnapping, which is kind of interesting because that corresponds to, to what John's talking about with potentially what's happening here. And if, it, if what they're describing is something that's ET-like, well, there could, there could very well be a, a correspondence there. Right. And Devin, are you still with us? I, I see that you are, right? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> hey, Devin. Okay. Hey, Robin. Hi. I have had experience in my research where I have found strange things at Mount Shasta. I have found disappearances, just too many disappearances for the public good. I'll just say that. Um, there and was, do you know of any other places? One... I'm sorry, you talking about are you talking about the. The the hunter that went on ahead of his wife and he he vanished. No, the one I was thinking of, it was he wasn't with his wife. He was with a friend. He he went every year with a group of people, and he literally walked ahead of them because he had to get to the next point because he had to take medication or whatever it was. But um, it was a straight shot. It was open area where they could physically see him, you know, and he left just a short time before they did while they packed up the rest of the camp. There wasn't woods. There wasn't anything. It was just a straight shot up the mountain in open country, and he never made it to the point. He never made it where, I mean, there was like a check-in point he was walking to. He never made it there. And you see, that, they saw that, is, where, that is terrifying. Yeah, and they saw where his footprints were, and it got halfway up there, and then there were no footprints in the snow. There was no other tracks in the snow. Uh There was no tracks of anything anywhere. His came to a dead stop. And And they never found his belongings or him. What you are describing is straight out of Ambrose Bierce's most famous short story. It's only one page long, and it's called "The Problem with Crossing a Field." And there was a, oh, wow. was a farmer that. Oh, it's 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 it, and it's it's on. We've got it on Sorcerer's Dictionary. I mean, everybody can. The, the problem with crossing a field by Ambrose Bierce. It's one of the most. I mean, it, it's it's about as terrifying as Who Goes There by by John Campbell. Uh, which is the basis for Thing from Another World, all three of those movies. But it is well, I think it's just, terrifying. It's just, yeah, I think it's just frightening because when you look at all of the information all over the world, it's not like it's in just one state or one country. This happens all over the world. People just completely vanish, like they were never there to begin with. And it's frightening. I mean, it could happen to you. You could walk out to the mailbox, never come back. You know, I mean, well, I know it sounds okay. crazy, but it really is frightening. Well, I want to make an announcement, Robin, is that Robin now has my address. So if she ever doesn't <laughs> hear from me by the end of the day, she better be trying to I'm call me. I'm sending out morning. the National Guard. That the National exactly Guard right. would be called. We do not know. I've got it saved. Good, good. I'm, you, you ought to probably write it down, too, just. Just because it's oh yeah, I have it screen captured. I have it saved. I'm not losing it. That's right. That's right. Uh, that, that's good. And in fact, I probably need to send it to all of the Scary Cast co-hosts because y'all are yeah, the best friends I've ever had. 
and John LeMay. Um, in fact, I've got John LeMay's address right here. And, I've, you know, I've, John, when you sent me a couple of books, I, I took out your address and I put it in the 1919 book. Which, which you kind of dedicated to me because I sure didn't want to ever lose John LeMay's address. You know, that's one of the more important addresses. It's about like rock. It's like all the addresses of all the great scary cast co-hosts. But anyway, Devin, I wanted to ask you something. Uh, you have done a lot of research. You've got a magnificent – oh, John LeMay, did you, did you look at Devin's documentary? Yes, I finally had the pleasure of watching it and it helped me finally finish my chapter on the underground lizard people, so thank you. Yeah, that's going to be in the same awesome. book as this. Uh, yeah, same book I as the thing that. we I want to see that. I didn't realize about. it was done. Yeah. I mean, it, it is like it is like w- one of the best documentaries I have ever seen. For John, do you for have it? You can send it to me? Yeah, I've got, I've got the link from Devin. I'll send it uh, along with uh, the other stuff I'm going to send, I'll sh- I'll send that link to all the Scary Cast hosts. And, Please uh, do. Th- oh, absolutely, I will. Because here here's the deal about that one. I said, Devin, you do, you do videos. Why don't you do a documentary on the lizard people of Los Angeles? And I, oh my God! Did he ever do it, Devin? Did you ever do a documentary? It was incredible. I mean, it's oh, like thank you. You're you're the you're the quiet one it. of the group, and you've got you've got absolutely more talent than so many of us have in so many ways. Yeah, yeah it was incredible. But but anyway, Devin, I was going to ask you, and you and it, it may be a non-answer, but I was going to ask you: Do you know of any places? in California where people have vanished other than Mount Shasta. I mean, we know they vanished on Mount Shasta. Oh, my God. Yeah. I don't know any, like, you know, places that people, you know, have stories about like that in particular. I do have a story of, like, a a group disappearance from L.A., um, which happened just a couple of years before I moved here, actually, back in 1998. Um, I don't know if you know the writer Carlos Castaneda. He was kind of considered like the godfather of New Age, and he had a book oh, called Oh, Carlos Castaneda is one of, one of the greatest writers. I've got three of his books sitting on my bookshelf right now. I yeah, love well, the guy. So do you know? Do you know what happened after he passed away? No. So he had Tell he had a group of he had a group of disciples or students or whatever you want to call them they were all they were all women pretty much and these they were kind of known as the witches of Castaneda he called them his witches and they lived with him in his kind of compound that they lived in in Westwood and after he passed away um, within days all five of them just disappeared vanished and they've only ever found one of them they found her body up in Death Valley Um, they couldn't determine the cause of death uh, you know, people might speculate that it's suicide, but frankly, there's no evidence of any kind. Um, but the other four have just completely disappeared, never been located. Oh, my God. That's a lot like, I don't know if if everybody on this podcast remembers the movie Season of the Witch. Does anybody remember that movie? The quietest anyone's ever gotten. I don't think you so. Need to put yeah, no, I'm, I don't remember it at all. You need to watch Season of the Witch. Donovan, the great singer, Donovan did the song Season of the Witch. It was a number one hit back in the 60s in the UK. And you need to watch Season of the Witch. It is an incredible film. It is one of those films that should have gotten nominated for an Academy Award but it was probably a little too controversial, you know. It's kind of like kind of like the stuff I do with sorcerer Jason McClendon and our introduction to sorcery book. I mean, it's like whenever I tell people that the book's coming out, their eye their eyes just they, they roll their eyes back in their head. They say, "Oh God, what is that?" I mean, you you know what it is. And he told me today. It is. It looks like absolutely Eastern Orthodox Church. 
the Eastern Orthodox Church is a carbon copy of what we have in in Introduction to Sorcery, and, and I'm I'm not embarrassed to sell it. I think it's it's actually a pretty fine book, uh, and I learned a lot doing it. And, and it, it's okay. It's a, it, it's in a way – now, Robin, don't, don't get scared. In, in a way, it's like a grimoire, which is a, a book of spells, but there are no spells in it. We just explained what this stuff is, and I think there are a lot of people that really don't know what sorcery is. And if you're a white sorcerer like Jason McClendon is from Coleman, Alabama, it's not going to hurt you. I mean, it, it, it's not. It's about how do they do things? Who do they call upon? Nature spirits. It explains all that, and it's interest. It, it's interesting. It's intellectual, and that's why I like it. It's nothing bad because I don't. I don't do bad things. But anyway, uh, yes, Devin. First of all, thank you so much for telling us about Castaneda's witches. Um, we need. I, I'm going to write that down because I need to find. Do you, is there an article like in the L.A. Times about this? Yeah, I think there's a few, actually. I can send you a few links, and it's definitely something I would like to uh, explore further with all of your help. <laughs> well, you've got it, and you know what? We might just add this to Look Up in the Sky, Aliens, UFOs, and Anomalies, second edition. We might just add this because th- this is like – and, and and we'll attribute it, we'll attribute the idea of disappearances to John LeMay, who introduced us to 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 disappearances on Scary Cast. Is that all right, John? Oh, well, there, there's plenty of disappearances before I ever brought them up, but but sure. If you well, no, no, no. You, you, you're, you're our guru on disappearances because you've got the in, you got the Inuit disappearance, and you have and and you and you. And you've made me mad about what came out 50 years later and all that stuff. So you made me mad in a good and intellectual way. So I'll say that. And so I would say that Robin, in her way yeah. of looking at things, which is remote viewing, she just said they were taken. They vanished. Right, Robin? Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. So, John, can I interject here for a sec? They didn't you, stay you, here, let me tell you. Yeah, so I was uh, just researching a few things. One called the Alaskan Triangle. Have you ever heard of that, uh, John? It's like yes. the Bermuda Triangle of uh, the Arctic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so another, tell us a little and, bit about uh, it. I'm just I, reading about I it now. I about it, and, 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 I, and I think it's, 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 fairly, it's a fairly spectacular idea, especially – with so many yep. people uh, vanishing in the Alaskan Triangle. So please tell us. Yeah, so I'm looking at it now on the map, and it's not really around where he was talking about, but nonetheless, it's still uh, up there. I'm just reading about it now because it's in Alaska. That's obviously the United States, not Canada. But just in like the first two, two or three sentences, it's saying, many of the reports of missing people are centered here as well, with have something possible to do with cryptids that supposedly roam here so you know uh it, there's there seems to be like some folklore or uh or something going on here and i know based on where i was in bc obviously that's a big bigfoot area and uh even like uh, a lot of native friends whose families go way back there and uh they were very in tune with the fact that there was cryptids there bigfoot and that was the area where i saw what i saw whatever that was so i don't know if it's bigfoot and uh in this area, too, there's a lot of missing people just in general. Uh, they've attributed that to just, like, hitchhikers picking them up and, uh, you know, kidnapping them. But you never know what's going on up there, whether it's uh, something ET or uh, cryptid in general. Potentially there are – there is something going on here. And everything I'm looking at here based on – there seems to be disappearances. So there's a, there's a reoccurrence here with that. I'm going to say this. There, there are not many Jeffrey Dahmers in the world. And, you know, there aren't many dudes that will pick up dudes and, and off them. I mean, it just, you know, thank God it, it just doesn't happen. I mean, Jeffrey Dahmer was one of a kind for sure because we used to do a show called Murder 123 until it just got too grisly for me. You remember that, Robin? Oh, yeah. 
and it just got too grisly and too dark for me. I just didn't want to do it anymore. Yep. Uh, and and but I mean, there aren't that many Jeffrey Dahmers. So otherwise, where did where did they go? As they say up in the Appalachians, where did they go? Well, you know, we we can probably hypothesize on ScaryCast exactly where they went um, because uh, the, the, the king of paranormal authorship, John LeMay, has brought to our attention the idea of disappearances. And I want to mention four disappearances. Uh, one's explained, three are absolutely not. First of all, the Mary Celeste. Has anyone ever heard – John LeMay, have you ever heard of the Mary Celeste? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. It was it was a ship, and somewhere about 30 days after it sailed from New York on its way to Genoa, Genoa, Italy, and it had denatured alcohol, which is a great way to get yourself screwed up. I mean, that will mess you up. I mean, oh, my God. And so about a month after it sailed, they found it, and it was just sailing by itself, just drifting toward Portugal. And just an amazing thing, um, you know, the, the Mary Celeste, and I think the consensus is today we can probably attribute it to the crew getting extremely drunk and extremely violent. Now, John LeMay, I know you're a little familiar. Does that does that even sound like an appropriate conclusion? I don't know. I would think if that's what happened, there'd be bodies all over the ship, but there was no bodies on there, right? That is correct. There were no bodies. There was a no, little I, bit I'll of blood. Say, yeah. Hmm. Well, the blood. That, so I'll yeah, the say. Blood, yeah. I'll just say that you know, may, you know, maybe there's enough evidence that 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 was the case. That it was the crew. They got extremely drunk and messed up on denatured alcohol, which is which is what we call ethanol, and you can drink it, and it won't kill you, but it'll just about kill you, and it'll mess your mind up. So, I mean, I think there is enough. There's enough evidence that that may have happened, but I'll just say that. And that, but now we get. Let me let me go down here on my notes because I made copious notes. Malaysian Airlines Flight 370. Does anybody remember John Lemay? Do you remember Malaysian Flight oh, 370? Yes. I was. What well, what made that even creepier is when I saw that on the news. I was in a big airport, like sitting there waiting on my next. Flight having a drink, and that's where I saw yeah. that. You're oh saying, oh, yeah, that was unbelievable. All right, yeah. well, now I've got a story to share that I have never shared on Scary Cast or anywhere, and and I'm pleased to share it because this is you talk about the truth. This is the truth. I'm sitting there at a fundraiser with Dr. Sally Ryan Feather, who is J.B. Ryan's daughter. And there was a psychic comedian. He was kind of funny. And he said, you know, what's the biggest question you've got? And someone raised their hand and said, Malaysian Flight 370. And all of a sudden, at the table to the right of me, and I then realized I'm sitting next to Sally Ryan Feather. I said, oh, my God. I'm sitting next to, to, the, to the lady whose dad invented the name ESP, and that man must be Joe McMonagall, who is considered the greatest remote viewer in the world now that Ingo Swan has passed away. And he was very good friends with Ingo Swan. And what he did is he smiled at me, and he shot me an image of the Saigon River, and he colored it red and white like a peppermint stick. And he put a star right next to it in Cambodia. And believe it or not, where do you think that years later, where do you think that they found 
Malaysian Flight 370, John LeMay. Right where you said. Exactly. And and that was that was unbelievable. It was like the most vulgar display of remote viewing. Robin, you know how it is when you do remote viewing and all of a sudden you just see something and you can't help it, but you see it, correct? Exactly. And, and a Joe lot of McMahon, times you don't even and, understand it. You just know you have, that's what you see. Right, but he shot me an image into my head, and I will never forget that image uh, because Saigon means snake. It's the Snake River. Mm. And he did, he, it, it was incredible. It was one of the most incredible moments I have ever had. And I knew where Flight 370 was. It was in Cambodia. Now, why it was in Cambodia, I don't know. Now, what they say, the conspiracy theorists want to say that it was uh, in Diego Garcia. Now, do you all know what Diego Garcia is? No. Mm-mm. That is the most secret CIA stronghold in the world, and it is an atoll. And it is in the in the Indian Ocean, and you can't get within a thousand miles of it, or you're going to be dead. It is, it's a terrifying place. I've read stories about people who've been captured and in Diego Garcia, and they've been released, and they said it was one of the most frightening experiences they ever had. That is the American CIA. It's about like, oh, what's the place in, um, what's the place in Cuba? Guantanamo Bay. Bay? Guantanamo Bay, that's right. It's about like our other side of the world, Guantanamo Bay, but it is terrifying. I just hope, I really do hope the men in black don't come get me. I mean, I really don't. <laughs> but Malaysian Flight 370 landed in Cambodia, and it was, and then of course I had David Pilates because David has, David has done a lot of research on what has happened. With people that have disappeared Now some people say Well they, people just disappear But David Pilates Now Robin You know a bit about him Do you yeah. care to Offer any Opinions or whatever about David Pilates Well You know he used to be a detective And I'm sure he has great Resources from that but you know He's very thorough He is extremely thorough with the information that he gets, you know, I will say that. And I think, you know, he does a really extraordinary job of getting all the facts. Okay, thank you. I mean, because I've I've read a lot of bad things about David Pilates, and I always kind of thought that that he did a good job. So you 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 let me know that, and thank you. So just you know, he's another guy that deals with disappearances. But then the one that Scary Cast spent two weeks on the Dyatlov Pass up there in the Ural Mountains in Russia where it was freezing cold. And, yeah, and, and what they claim went on in there and different information that I got, it, it's not <clears> – <throat> the information that I was given was from people that had a little bit more inside Info and I think there's a a lot of discrepancies. I think, you know, a lot of people just kind of blew it off and said, you know, the Bigfoot did it because they they did see one. They said, you know, the snowman lives. They wrote it in that notebook, um, and they did find tracks from one around there. You know, and I think a lot of people have the beliefs that that's what did it. And I, you know, my own my own personal opinion be that what it may, it had nothing to do with it. Were they there? Yeah, but that they weren't the ones that did it. Well, my opinion is maybe like your opinion is that was ETs. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, to begin with, KGB came in. Okay, there were lights in the sky. There had been lights in the sky and UFOs spotted in the sky in that area for three days. I think three or four days prior, and it, there was people that had reported seeing lights in the sky that night that all that happened. Then the KGB came in. And once you really get into that and you dig deep and and try to get more information, 
there were boot covers from the KGB that were found there, indicating they were all over that site area where the hikers were, where the camp was and where they were found. Okay, if these kids are in a tent and, you know, and they, they obviously saw what they believed to be the snowman because they, they wrote it in the book and they said the snowman lives. And then they, there were slices in the tent where they were peeking out. Do I believe that they saw them there? 110% because you're talking about they're going way up in the mountains where the yetis are or excuse me, the snowman or whatever you want to call them, Bigfoot, whatever, and you're now in their area, and it's an area that most people aren't there. I guarantee you they were there to find out why they were there. And I'm sure they were screaming and hollering and carrying on. That doesn't mean they killed anybody. But something happened to make these people leave a tent without shoes, without, you know, the proper clothing or whatever. And I just, and this is just me, I don't believe that it was the foots that did it. I do see some tendencies, like when they said that the one person they found dead, the ribs were crushed. That is something that if a Bigfoot were to do it, they would squeeze them and it would crush their ribs. However, what to me says it wasn't them was the tongue was removed. That's not a normal thing for them. Okay, then it said um, the eyes. There was a, a situation with the eyes. That was not normal for them either. And then you get to the fact where there was radiation all over that ground. Now, the Bigfoots have a different energy. They have a different vibration. They don't have radiation. What do you normally find that, that has radiation residue afterwards? UFOs and ETs. UFOs. So I just think that there were so many things. And the other thing I saw, too, they did a documentary on it. And after I watched it, I talked to my, my personal sources that had information on it. But the second documentary they did on it they went to go into the negatives they they had in this vault the negatives from the hikers cameras that they recovered and in it was apparently some really pertinent information and when this new documentary team went in to look for that suddenly they were gone all the other um portions of the films were there but the negatives to the most important part had vanished which means there's a cover-up going on, you know. Well, so it, I mean, there's just too much information I mean, Robin, that didn't I'll, make sense. Robin, I'll tell you something, and I want to reiterate this to everybody on this podcast, is you go out to find the police reports for the lizard man, they don't exist. Yep. They're gone. And now yep. that I've got this great, this great thing, the Sydney Monsters up in Tabor City, which were it was a gigantic deal in 1973. John LeMay, do you think the police reports are still around for the Sydney Monsters? What do you think? Mm, I almost say no. Yeah, I You're would correct. be helpful. And wow. I am going See, whenever to you get them. into yeah, whenever you get into these hard topics like the ETs, the Lizard Man, the Bigfoot. UFOs, whatever, what is the common denominator? Information on them disappears. It's gone because they don't want the public to know. Now, if this was a a case where the Bigfoot had done this, and it's not me defending them because, trust me, I know just as evil as that some of them can be horrible, just like our people. It's not any different. There's good and bad in everything. Most of them are primarily very very kind, but there are some that are just absolutely lethal. So do and a lot of them are way up in the mountains like that, where they they go up there to get away from people, and then people run up there looking for them. So these hikers are up there, and if they didn't counter it, how in the world would KGB know about it? They're up in a mountain, isolated, with no way to communicate to anybody. So what brought the KGB in that night? A Bigfoot didn't get the KGB, and the the photo that they had. This is what I found humorous. The photo that they had of what they called the snowman peeking out from around the tree. Blow it up, lighten it up. It's wearing pants. So I don't know what that thing was, but it had on pants. It was really bizarre looking. It, I mean, it, it to me that didn't look like any type of a snowman, but that's beside the point. 
if it was just a matter of they encountered the snowman up there, they had no way to get help from anybody. They couldn't contact anybody. There was no way the KGB would have been brought in because they wouldn't have had any knowledge of it. Let there be lights in the sky. Let there be a UFO. KGB will be all over that in a minute. Something brought the KGB in that night because when the they actually – located the site and got there yes there were prints from that looked like it was from a bigfoot but there were boot covers that were kgb issued not regular military kgb they're not just going to go up on that mountain where that was at at that location for no reason it had to be major i have a question uh for john uh for somebody who's obviously has his finger on the pulse as far as uh the whole UFO phenomenon and agenda things going on. Uh, Back in the 90s, you know, when you watch a lot of these shows, uh, abductions was such a big thing. Like there's these people getting abducted. It was a reoccurring story that happened. Uh, It always was back in the past. I haven't heard of anything dealing with abductions in the last 10 years. Is there any, like, contemporary uh, information about abductions? Is that something that's still going on? Is there still people reporting these? And, you know, with the reoccurring story, kind of with the grays and this genetic uh, agenda and this, that, and other. Is this still something that's going on, or was that something that happened in the 80s, 90s, and really is not a thing these days? Do you know anything about that? That's really an astute observation, because as into this as I am, I never stop to think, why are there not as many abduction stories as there were were back in the 90s and the 80s? Um, (laughs) So now you've got me thinking about it, and I wonder – I guess there's one of two possibilities. Um, one, maybe uh, it got oversaturated in the 80s and the 90s, and people just aren't as interested in it anymore, so they, they don't blow this stuff up. Or m- what might be even weirder is what if they stopped happening? Like, uh, you know, some people say that the uh, the ETs and the, like the government had an agreement about abductions and how many people they could abduct a year. Like, what if the they agreement did, yeah. ran out? Oh, so that's right? Okay. Wow. That is actually very correct. The problem with that was um, there was two agreements. There was the one that Eisenhower signed, and there was one prior to Eisenhower. And you, anybody can go on Google now and look up the one by Eisenhower. His granddaughter has made it public, and she's now going to conferences I, talking about it. I, I know and, her, the granddaughter fact, of Eisenhower. Yeah, Laura Eisenhower, correct? Yes. I believe her fact, name is, yeah. um, I have a conference I'm doing in Nebraska, and one of the members of the team for that conference knows her and was going to see if she would consider coming. I don't know if she ever asked her or not. I'm friends with her um, on Facebook. I'm friends with her on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Well, prior to Eisenhower, there was also an agreement, and it was all for technology. That was the whole purpose of it. Unfortunately, the first agreement that they made was not with a group of ETs that were actually good. And the government was so hot to get their hands on the technology, they did it. And But one of the two of the conditions, the only condition our government had was the people don't get harmed and they're returned, and they have no memory of it. And on the ET side, it was, one, you are never to disclose that we exist. And the other one was that they could keep people if they needed to. And my understanding is that they argued quite vigorously about, you know, you can't keep them or whatever, and there's supposed to be a certain amount of people they could only take. And anyway, they they were dealing with a a very bad group, and they just simply did whatever they want. And the government didn't really, I mean, I'm not going to say they didn't do anything about it, but they were fearful of the group they were dealing with because they were, at that point, they were taking whoever they wanted. And so they kept the secret because they were afraid not to. And then you fast forward to Eisenhower, and then Eisenhower signed a treaty as well. I mean, we've been being sold to the ETs for a long time. As far as the genetic program, the people that I know, the contacts that I have, and that I don't know everybody on the planet. I'm just telling you, you know, from the people I know and my own personal experiences, it is alive and well. They are still doing the genetic breeding program. There is, um, I don't want to say his name because that's not fair to him, uh, somebody that is regularly abducted 
And the last time they took him, they simply explained to him how they do the genetic manipulations. Interesting. And I was getting abducted. I, I, it's happened my whole life. I mean, when they took me when I was four years old, and that was in 68, they told me that wasn't the first time I had been taken. And this has gone on literally my entire life. They tried to, I mean, literally suck me up into this ship while I was wide awake, and that was back in 2013. And it's happened since then, but I'm just saying it's, it's never, I don't think it's, in my opinion, and I don't know everything, and I certainly don't claim to be an expert or anything like that, but in my opinion from the contactees that I work with and have contact with and have who contacted me, this is still going strong and it's getting worse. Now, as of two years ago, the one group said that we had not seen anything yet as far as what kind of things they're going to put on this planet. And they cross them with cow's blood as well as our blood. And the reason they're using cows is they claim that when they mix it with ours, it makes it easier to manipulate. Mm. You know, these things are very real. I mean, I get contacted by people a lot. I have a very dear friend of mine that lives in Florida that's been an abductee his entire life. In fact, he has an implant. I know multitude of people that have implants. You know, I mean, it, it's just really incredible. You know, I've got something in my ear that I can't get out. The doctor can't get out. The Bigfoot say it's an implant. I don't know that it is. But what I do know is whenever we're going to have a lot of UFOs around here, it hums and then it drains. And it's consistent with every time. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I'm not going to say it's an implant because I don't have any proof that it is. But what I will say is that it's perfectly fine, and then when the UFOs are around, I get a humming, and I get pressure, and I get drainage out of my that ear every single time. But, John, uh, like, is there any, like, things that you can think of, like, contemporary that uh, deals with abductions or firsthand ET experiences that is part of the new kind of, uh, you know, developments or experiences in the field, uh, like reports or anything? No, and I think my problem is I've been uh, sticking my nose so far into the past for for knowing nice books. We've just been zeroed in on that and haven't even thought about. uh, But you are right. I don't hear about abductions as much. I mean, I believe what Robin said. I I just mean like they're not publicized anymore. Yeah, I don't think people are talking about it like they used to. I know the people that have contacted me are like, why bother? Because as soon as we bring it up, we have the men in black at our door. Well, I remember and back in the become, '90s, it was always there was always shows like uh, all, always on like TV about abductions, and it always seemed like in the '80s and '90s it was such a big thing with the reoccurring abduction stories and things. Yeah. And it's just it's not something I hear hear about anymore. You know, it's interesting. Yeah, I think you know the men in black have a lot to do with that because the people that I've talked to, and I you know it doesn't mean I've talked to everybody. It's just people I have talked to that are aware of the situation or have had it happen to them, they don't want to mess with it. They don't want the government interference, you know, and they don't want to be ridiculed. They don't, you know, I don't think that it's that in my opinion is only just that I don't think it's gone away. I actually think it's picked up. I just don't think people are Mm -hmm. talking about it anymore. You know, I mean, back in the seventies and eighties and even in the nineties, the ridicule people got, when they people found out about it, I didn't talk about all my experiences until probably the last four or five years. Because who wants to be ridiculed and treated like a freak? Uh-huh. And nobody's going to believe it. And nobody wants to, you know, nobody's going to believe him anyway. I think with me, I just got to the point where I thought, you know what, I just don't care. The truth is the truth. I can't change it. My stories never change. It's the same thing. So what comes to mind is, to me is like, was it a phase that happened and it was kind of like, you know, because there was movies out and everybody kind of uh, had this kind of all like kind of a phenomenon at the same time, whether it was their imagination or make uh, they're making it up or was there something going on legit during this time that stopped or like you're saying that it's still going on, but it's just not being disclosed to the same extent. So I'm wondering. Well, I think, I think too, when they, they used to talk about it back then, they really, not romanticized it, but it was like the way they presented it was like, oh, this is the coolest thing ever. And you see all these people that would go to Roswell and they're out there going, come and take me, come, you know what I mean? And you see all these people on the news 
And everybody was so excited about it. It was like the greatest thing in the world. And nobody was talking about the psychological damage it does to a person. Nobody was talking about the physical damage that does to a person. It was romanticized to be the coolest thing out there. And I think that made people talk about it more. But then I think as time went by and the men in black became involved and people were being treated poorly because of sharing that experience and then the psychological effects of what they'd gone through. And I just think people went quiet. I think there's some phases that that happens too. Like I remember about 10, 15 years ago, like a a big phase was this like star seed phenomenon. Like everybody's from this like star seed thing. Now we don't, I don't hear about that so much. I'm still in the same groups and things are still there, but it seems like there's some kind of phases that go on in the UFO community. Yeah, I agree. uh, Yeah, I don't hear about those anymore either. Yeah. Interesting. Wow, this has been quite an illuminating discussion when we started talking about disappearances, John LeMay. And what I'd like to do, um, because we have about 15 minutes left, I would like for you to recap, you know, kind of where we've gone where we where we come to and where we're going to go from here and if you don't have any answers you know you're fine but just what do you what do you think about this whole disappearances thing and the and the excitement that we have generated about abductions because it seems like we're some of the last people talking about abductions doesn't it maybe yeah um and again like you said just for a brief recap in case somebody tuned in late We've been talking about this uh, Inuit village that completely disappeared uh, back in 1930. You know, I mean, not like the the huts and everything disappeared, but like the people disappeared, and there's just no trace of them. And, you know, it was a real article. There was a real uh, Canadian mounted police investigation into it. And to this day, nobody knows where these people went. And um, the only thing really against that story is the fact that the uh, author of the article chose to copyright his article, and that's very unusual for a you know nonfiction you know article. You don't usually copyright those, so that's the only troubling thing about that story. But otherwise, you know, I I believe that the most logical explanation for where they all went probably was like a mass abduction of, event, and. Um, you know, this, uh, mass abductions and, and people just completely disappearing. Um, like Robin said, it's been going on for just ages and ages. And I wish we could have uh, talked a little bit about uh, the Anasazi that uh, allegedly nobody knows where they went. That's a tribe from, you know, the southwest and New Mexico area. Have, have you all heard of the, the Anasazi since we have some time left? Yeah. yeah. No. no yeah, I haven't. Just Pl- briefly. Please. Please tell us about it. I I can't remember much about them other than they predated most of the other Native American tribes, and they were uh, thought to be like probably the builders of Chaco Canyon in northern New Mexico. And Chaco Canyon, I can't remember all the details about Chaco Canyon, but it has like this really unique alignment with the stars, and um, it has a lot of those, um, gosh, I forget the technical term for them, but they're these circular, these uh, cir- circles within the the buildings, and the Native Americans would say that's where their they basically would claim that those were stargates, and that's where their gods would emerge or you know come to and from. And um, again, to this day, nobody really knows where the Anasazi went. It's kind of a, a mystery. And Robin, what do you what do you know about the Anasazi? It really not much, John. Just I remember hearing about the name and the, that they had disappeared without a trace. I mean, what I know you could write on the back of a pen, um, but I, I do recognize the name. And like I said, the only thing I ever heard was, you know, that that was another tribe that had absolutely vanished. Another one that comes trace. to mind, too, is is like uh, Mayan, uh, like back in the ancient Mayan tribes. They had these huge cities and pyramids and things, and it just seems like... I've heard that they've just disappeared. Obviously, they were conquered by the conquistadors and whatnot, but it, I've heard things of uh, where there's, like, ancient tribes that, like, in the South Americas, too, that just seem to have disappeared as well. Yeah, and I think in each of the cases that I've personally heard, not all of them, but, I mean, the ones that I've heard, there was, like, again, like I said earlier, there was no trace. There was no evidence of them leaving 
whether on foot, on horseback, wagon, whatever, they were just simply, there was no evidence that they ever left. All their personal belongings were left behind, everything that they would need to survive, weapons, whatever, everything was left. The only thing that wasn't left was their person and the clothes they had on at the time. You know, I mean, if somebody's going to leave, they're not going to leave all their clothing. They're not going to leave their weapons. They're not going to leave yeah. all these things. And there's going to have to be a way that they left. And there was just never any evidence of any form of them moving on. You know, and then again, if they're going to move on, why were their weapons not taken? Why was their clothing not taken? Why were not their, you know, bowls or whatever they used for day-to-day living? None of that was taken. It was like everything was there just as they left it. They were just all gone, and there was no remaining people. I'm just going to throw it out there. Is it possible that some of these cultures or tribes reached a state of maturity or whatever else where they kind of transcended this uh, this world? Uh, maybe it was abduction, but maybe they were you know, being watched and things. And once they've re- reached a certain state, they're extracted, and then everybody else here on the planet is still kind of uh, waiting to graduate, so to speak. Anything is possible. I don't think we have any way of knowing. I mean, nothing, there was no evidence of anything in a lot of these cases. So I think it, we would be remiss if we didn't look at all the possibilities. Rather than the most normal possibilities, which are not always true. That's interesting. Right. Well, John, well, John LeMay, I say we we can't thank you enough for joining us. You have we always love have it when you're on, about, John. John, well, I always brought love about being more, on. So thanks all for having me. You brought about more interesting conversation this time, I think, than ever before. And I want yeah, to thank really you good. very much. And 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 John, what are your latest couple of books so that we know what to do at, at Amazon? Yeah, uh, for our listeners, I'd say UFOs in the Roaring Twenties is the one that's going to be mo- of most interest to them. And then apart from that, uh, if you all like the old Pink Panther movies with Peter Sellers, those comedies, I also did a book on those. And nobody's ever done a book before on the Pink Panther movies. So if you're a Pink Panther fan, I just did that as well. Oh, cool. And I, I would really, after um, Dr. John sends you those photos, I'd love to hear your thoughts. In, yeah, uh, I would love Amazon to see them. So. They'll find yourself. So we just type in John LeMay, we'll find yourself, right, John? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yep, on Amazon, John LeMay, L-E-M-A-Y. You'll, you'll just find a whole author's, author's page full of all sorts of weird stuff. So It's great. And I want to, and, and I want to thank our to scary, check it out. And I want to thank our scary cast panelists, the Queen of Scary Cats, Robin McRae from Canada, our man in Niagara Falls, Canada, Mark Johnston, who's been all Yay. over Canada, and and Devin Tate, and I want to Yay. thank all of you. Mm-hmm. And we've had the most fun. We always have a great time. Next week is our Valentine's Day special. Devin Tate, I'm going to have to talk with you on that because we've got to get your music back on. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Yeah, and I want to get the link for that documentary. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, John LeMay, thank you so much. It was really interesting tonight. Oh, it was a blast. Well, that's great. And, And John, I sent you a Facebook Facebook friend request to add me if you like. uh, like Oh, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I was. I kind of looked at my phone while we were talking, and I saw that, and I thought I didn't know Mark and I were already friends, but I saw your attachment, so thank you. Yeah, it says uh, it says I send requests. Yeah, I don't think you've added me yet, so check up on that and add me if if you haven't already. Okay, I will. Through okay, cool. So we're all going to be connected with John Lemay, and that's great. So look, thanks everybody. This has been a most wonderful skit. Next week, our Valentine's Day episode that will be with. Um, Jen Cruz, and the Queen of Scary Cast, Robin McRae. The next week we will have um, 
We will have the, the the king of New Hanover Tavern, Scott Dills. It'll be a lot of fun. And then uh, just more stuff on ScaryCast. So we'll see you next week. Um, and be sure John, to listen before to you it. pop off, Don't... before okay, you pop let, off, let, let I did not get that. Okay. You did not get what? I did not get the friends request because I'm under Robin Haynes McRae. If you send it to Robin McRae, I'll never get it. Okay. So, so when they send it, told them, that's great. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Sure. And, and, and we're, we're going to have a great time the next ensuing weeks for the rest of time on Scary Cast. And John Lemay, you will be back. I hope on uh, one, two, three, four, five, six on March the sixth, and we'll have more great things to talk to you about. Okay. Absolutely. All right, we'll see you again. I'll do a call around to all of the panelists and our guests, so your your phone will ring pretty soon. I promise you that. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Take care, Great everybody. Hi. Right, good night. Good night. Good night. And Bye. Loris Burke. Uh, and I can't thank everybody. In don't answer it. It might be the men in black. Okay. <laughs> Cheers and take care. Bye. Bye. Good night. We're trying to end the episode, but the British lady may not come along for a bit. But we're trying to end it. So everybody can hang up and thanks a lot. We'll see you next Scarecast, 9 p.m. Eastern. Thank you.